Dear students, a warm welcome to VTU eShikshana program. In this video, we are going to see about the module 3 of the subject Artificial Neural Network, the continuation of module 3, Support Vector Machines and Radial Basis Functions. Let me see about the further content. In the previous video, we have come across with an introduction about the module 3 of artificial neural network and we have come across a small definitions and the learning process of the statistical theorem. Those things we come across over there. In this video, we are going to discuss about the statistical learning theory. What actually the statistical learning theory is? Let me see. What actually the statistical learning theory states? The statistical learning theory is the broad framework for studying the concepts of interference in both supervised and unsupervised missions, which is going to provide the concept, it is going to provide a path to study about the concept of interference in both supervised and unsupervised machine learning. Inference covers the entire spectrum of the machine learning. From that we are going to gain knowledge, making the predictions or decisions and we are going to construct the new models. That is going to be done from this statistical theory, learning theory. So the entire process which are going to be seen over there is uh, from a set of labeled or unnamed, unlabeled data, we are going to do the process over here. So the entire process is going to be stated in a statistical framework, which every assumption stated mathematically as a null or alternative hypothesis. Coming to the next one, <coughs> why do or why does the statistical learning theory works in practice? Okay, how? How it's going to work in practice? In what way it's going to work in practice? The practical goal of this approach, if you're going to see about that, it's our to make the machine learning more precise. It's going to make the system to make to more precise. So, uh, reliably reproducible, that is the thing which is going to begin happening over there. So, such a way the practical approach is going to be find in the statistical learning theory. And as, as well, it is to create or improve a model algorithm. So, we are going to have a modeling, so that the modeling algorithm can be get created from this. This is the primarily accomplished by providing a formal or a statistical definition of the concept like learning, <coughs> generalization, overfitting and performance. So such a way we are going to make the statistical definitions of this abstract concepts like this learning, generalization, overfit and performance and also then testing this hypothesis on parameter at a time. Okay. So, we are going to do this analysis by doing the process of learning or overfitting or performance as well we are going to test this type of hypothesis one parameter at a time. Okay. So, each and everything is going to be get measured in terms of the particular parameter. So, the testing is going to be done one after another. First learning, then it can go for generalization, then it can go for overfit and it can go for performance. Okay. So, the testing of this hypothesis one parameter at a time is going to be done over there. Let me see about the goals. What is the goals which is going to get present over there in this particular learning approach? So, the general learning approach is the way as any other scientific disciplines are going to have the same way it is going to be there. Observing a phenomenon, just we are going to see 
and we are going to observe what's happening over there in the phenomenon, what and all the changes are going to be happen, how actually it's going to be get present, in what way it's going to be get taken into the thing. So that is going to be the first one, we are going to observe a phenomenon. Second one, construct. We are going to construct a model for that particular phenomenon, for that phenomenon which we have observed. For that phenomenon, we are going to construct a model. That is the second one. Construct a model of that phenomenon which we have observed that is going to be get constructed with the same parameters of a, as like a model. Okay. Third one, make predictions. We have to predict. After observing, we are going to create a model. Once the model is going to be created, we have to predict, make predictions using this model which we have constructed over there. The model which we constructed, that model has to be predict, it has to predict. So we have to make predictions using this model, okay. So this is a general learning approach and goals in the particular scientific discipline. As observe a para phenomenon, construct a model for the phenomenon and make predictions using this phenomenon. Uh, but in statistical machine learning, the entire process needs to be the entire process needs to be automated to learn from it. So each set of the scientific method is assumed to be governed by a probabilistic model of this phenomenon. Okay. So, the entire process need to be get automated to learn from it. So, that the each step of the scientific approaches or the scientific methods it has been assumed to be governed by a, probab a probabilistic model of this phenomenon or the data which is going to be get generate from this process that is going to be also taken as a consideration. At this simplest level, this means assuming that if all past and future observations are going to be sampled randomly and independently through a continuous statistics hypothesis testing. As already I said over there, the hypothesis testing is going to be done one parameter at a time. So, in such a way, the samples are going to be randomly and independently, it is going to be get observed through the a continuous statistical hypothesis testing. Then this information about the underlying phenomenon as like that we are going to see about the probability distribution can be reliably inferred. So just an important thing that this allows the machine to construct a learning algorithm such as k nearest neighbors with appropriate case that are the consistence of reproducible data. So, which makes the general concept of deep learning possible. So, that uh, since as more and more data is going to be get processed over there, so the algorithm prediction get closer and closer to the optimal solutions. Such a way we are going to have the approach in this particular statistical learning theory. Let me see about the stochastic nature of this time, the time which we have been mentioned over there, the stochastic nature of the time. Uh, in generally, <clears throat> with the problem which is going to be a generalized problem in perception, so we will review some of the uh, milestones. We have to come across with some of the milestones of Wapnick's statistical learning theory. In yesterday's, uh, in previous class, we have come across about that uh, Wapnick statistical learning theory which is based on the learning from an examples as in this case what we are going to do a learning is a stochastic process with the data being drawn from two set of variables as input x and input d. So one is going to be an input vector and the response or the output is going to be get considered over there. The important point actually what we have to note is that relationship between the values of x and d, between the values of x and d. These are the probabilistic values. An element from this x does not map 
uniquely to an element of D. Its countability be mapped uniquely. Rather, it defines a probability distribution on the element D. So, alternatively, for this x of i or j or k drawn from x with a probability of p of x of i comma j comma k the responder dk is going to be observed with the probabilistic data of this p of d by x which is going to be called as a conditional probabilistic of d of k to the given x and this is going to be called as the marginal probability. In the last previous video, we have come across about this marginal probability and the conditional probability. In other words, we can say that an unknown probability distribution P of x comma d defines on the product of x into d determines the probability of observing a training data, a training data points which is going to be taken as P of P of x k comma d k. So, which is going to be dealt as like that point which is going to be get present over the training data point. So, therefore, the training data set T is going to be taken into a consideration of T is equal to the training data which is going to be considered that T is equal to flower bracket of comma dk where k is equal to 1 to q. So, that is going to be a deal over there is actually generated by sampling the space of x cross d at q times at q times in accordance with the distribution of this p of p of probability of x comma d which gives this formalization. So, the learning problem boils down to search for the appropriate estimated function so that the function f which is going to be tends from x to d which is going to tends from x to d. So, which can be used in a predictive way or predictive mode to generate a value of d in the response of an unseen in input of x. So, we say that this unknown because the source of randomness can be more than one and the randomness can be difficult, it not impossible to characterize, uh, characterize actually there are many noise in the measured measurements or noise in the inputs or sometimes it may be governing the process might itself be a stochastic. So, the figure if you are going to see about this figure it shows the, it emphasizes the stochastic nature of generating the training data set. In order to successfully solve a regression or a classification task, a learning machine learns an approximation function x comma w, which is going to be also referred as a hypothesis. So, which is a function of both inputs x and the weight of w as the notation emphasize. Note that the discussion is going to be in general terms ok. The approximation function f being referred to may be realized by a neural network or a physiologic system or a support vector mission. So, move on to the next one a risk functionality, imperial risk minimization. This is going to be risk functional. So, which is going to be called as imperial risk minimization. A standard way to learn this function is to first define a risk functional that employs a loss function L to measure the average error. So, without aware about the function and the loss function, the average error may not be able to measurable. So, that we are going to take that one. So, that is going to be taken into a appropriate consideration over here. So, then the search we are going to search out an estimator from the space of hypothesis that minimizes the risk. If the loss function L, the loss function L which is going to be consisting of the data D which you have been taken over there with a function of f, uh, f of x comma w, 
which measures the error between the desired value of D and the predicted value of F. Then the expected risk may be get defined as like this. This is the expected value. So, the a derived value which is going to be sorry the desired value which is going to be D and the predicted value is going to be nothing but function of x comma w. So, which is going to decide the particular risk value. So, that the expected risk is going to be defined as R of f is equal to energy function of the loss value which is going to be mentioned over the loss of okay loss of the desired value with the probability function which is going to be called as a predicted value that go, both are going to be get present over there. And finally, we are going to take that one this is nothing but the integral part of last value with the predicted value. So, the risk function is a function of function of f which is going to be drawn from the function of a space capital F. So, it is a function drawn from the space function f that has to be get analyzed properly over here. So, where the integral is taken over the cross space of x cross x d, the cross space x cross d which is going to be taken. So, note that the risk is a function of function f that are drawn from the space of a function which is going to be denoted as a capital F. That is the way the risk function is going to be get expected value is going to be get derived over there. Coming to the loss function L which can take one of the following several forms actually which can take the several forms as square error function, absolute error function or the loss function. So, we are familiar with the square error function or L2 norms simply we are going to say that that is going to be L2 norm there is nothing but the loss function which have been mentioned over there it is going to be made into a square function this is going to be a square function. So, the desired value d comma the d is going to be subtracted and which is going to be consisting of the function. So, it is going to give the predicted value as like the square error function over here which results in the network performing an regression on the desired value as we saw alternately one of the uh, use or uh, one of the use is going to be nothing but an absolute error function absolute error function called as L1 norm this is going to be L2 norm this is going to be L1 norm how it is going to be there which is consisting of a modulus of the value it is going to be taking a modulus of that value l of d comma function x comma w is equal to modulus of d minus f of function x comma w. For, for these two classes of problems one can use the 0 to 1 loss function. So, we are going to make it into 0 to 1 loss function. In this case we are going to consider two variables as if condition is going to 0 or 1. So, we are going to take the last function L of d comma f of x comma w is equal to either it may be 0 or it may be 1 and if it is 0 during that time if f of x comma w is equal to desired value or else it is going to be 1 or else it is going to be 1 such a way we are going to identify 0 to 1 last function over there. So, these are the different forms of loss function as square error function, absolute error function and 0 to 1 loss function. Let me see about the optimal function which is going to be defined from this particular derivations. We denote as f naught the optical function is nothing but optimal function is going to be taken as f naught. So, simply we are going to make this is going to be an optimal function f not. So, it is going to be an optimal function which is going to minimize the expected risk which is going to be defined as R of f. So, this R of f is going to be minimized as f naught the optimal function which is going to be consisting of f of x comma w naught which is going to be having an average value of this minimum value which is going to be present in this R of f that is nothing but the expected risk value. 
So, the function f0 as defined by the optimal parameters w0 is called the target function. This w0 is going to be called as the target function and it is the ideal estimator. This is the ideal estimator. So, unfortunately what happened, we do not know that the probabilistic distribution p of the probability distribution p of x comma d p of x comma d so the only information we have in a finite set of q samples so that which is given to us as the training set therefore f not cannot be found in practice so f not cannot be found in practice that is a problem we are going to make it over there so cannot be found in practice so that we are going to do in a different way. So, let me discuss about this with the next topic called as Imperial Risk Minimization ERM. To solve the previous problem because the F0 cannot be found in practice due to we are going to aware about only the value of the probability distribution P of X comma D and which is going to be get sampled in Q samples which is going to be having a finite set of Q samples so that the F0 cannot be found in practice. To solve this problem, to solve that problem, Vapnik suggested the imperial risk manage, uh, minimization technique. This is nothing but a principle which is an induction principle that we can use to train the machine using the minimum number of or a limited number of data samples at hand. So, this imperial risk minimization generates a stochastic approximation of R using the training set T. So, that this approximation is going to be called as imperial risk R suffix E, imperial risk R suffix E. We are going to deal it as imperial risk R suffix E and it is going to be defined as the value as this approximation is going to be defined as R suffix E of F is equal to the sample rate what we have taken Q samples in a finite set 1 over Q summation of K is equal to 1 to Q and we are going to take in the function L of DK into F of xk into the weights which is going to be defined in such a way. So, this is going to be the actual approximation of the imperial risk and this is going to be defined in this expression as like that. Okay. So, let me see how the best minimizer is going to be happening in this particular imperial risk. This imperial risk estimation employs a specific loss which is going to employ a specific loss function and now depends on the given training set instance in addition to that of the value f, addition to that of the value f. So, we have to observe that r of e, r e of f will have its own minimizer in the, in the function f, so in the function space f. Say, the function f which is the function that our learning algorithm is ultimately going up with, then the imperial risk minimization principle replaces by r of f, which is going to replace us by r of f. When it is going to be replaced? If the function that our learning algorithm is ultimately going up with the particular thing then this imperial function which is going to be R e of f is going to be R e of f is going to be replaced by R of f. Okay. So, this R of f is going to be replaced sorry the R of f is going to be replaced by R e of f and tries to approximate f naught value to f f not value to f, f not by the function of f. So, note that we are not so much interested in finding the true value of f not as much as we are in trying to ensure that the f is similar to f not 
and in the sense of them both have expected risks that are closer to one another that is it ok. So, moving on to the next one the two important sequence limits it is going to be a more important thing that is going to be called as two important sequence limits are going to be there coming under the key theorem coming under the key theorem. What would like to ensure is the imperial uh, risk minimizer function f converges to the function f naught which minimizes the expected risk. So, that is what we want to ensure that. So, to ensure this one need to find the condition for this consistency of this EMR principle, sorry ERM principle ok, imperial risk minimization principle. So, this requires specifying the necessary and sufficient conditions for converging of this following two limits of sequence in a probabilistic sense that is going to be the important thing. So, as you are going to come over here to ensure the minimizer f closer to f naught we need to find the conditions for this consistency of this ERM principle consistency for this ERM principle and essentially we require the specifying the necessary and the sufficient conditions of this convergence of the following two limits. We are going to take about this two limits. What are the two limits? Just I am going to take in the next slide. So, the first limit if you are going to see about that, the first limit concerns the convergence of this values of this expected risks R of F naught with value of q is equal to 1, 2, etc. n of function F naught that minimizes the imperial risk R suffix E of F naught over a training set of the size q to the minimal uh, to the minimal possible values of the true value of R of F naught. So, that we are going to take that expression as limits q tends to infinite r of f of q tends to r of f of naught r of f of naught sorry r of f of naught. So, this is another way of saying that solutions found using ERM converge to the best possible solution. So, we are going to say that one the solutions found in using this ERM convergence to the best possible solution. This is going to be the first limit which is going to be specified over here. Move on to the next one, the second limit. The second limit concerns the convergence of the value of this imperial risk R e of f naught, the same thing as q is equal to maybe 1, 2, etc. up to n value. Once again to the minimal possible value of the true value or the true risk, true risk R of f naught. So, here the same function which is going to be get rely over here as limits as limits which is going to be tends to q to the limits which can tends to q to infinite the function which is going to be get replaced with or which tends to r of f naught. So, this amount of stating that the imperial risk cover, cover, covers converges to the value of the smallest risk. So, this property, this property of asymptotic consistency or a uniform convergence put forward by Vapnik and as presented ok as is presented. So, which states that the ERM principle is going to be consistent if and only if the imperial risk converges to the true risk in a probabilistic sense as stated in the theorem ok. So, that is going to be the second limit. Let me move on to the actual key theorem that is nothing but Vapnik key theorem. Let me <coughs> discuss about this L of d comma f of x comma w be a set of functions with their bounded loss for the probability measure which is going to be taken the probability measure something but p of x comma d 
So actually what happened this is going to be dealt as lag like thus a is going to be greater than or so less than or equal to that of the integral part of L of d comma f of x comma w into dp of x comma d where it is going to be less than or equal to b and a and b it is going to be rise between a and b. Then for the ERM principle the imperial risk minimization principle to be consistent it is necessary and sufficient that the imperial risk is going to converge uniformly to the expected risk over the set of the data which is going to be taken into L of d comma f of x comma w such that which is going to minimize as a limits q intends to q tends to infinite the probability of this particular value is going to be taken into consideration as 0. Recall that the supremum of a non-empty set in the smallest element that is greater than or equal to that of all other elements in a set. So this is going to be called as an uniform one side convergence in probability. It is going to be called as uniform one sided convergency in probability. Here this translates to saying that the probability that the spectrum of the sorry supremum of this difference between the R and RE the risk and the minimized imperial risk which is going to be computed over F being greater than some small number of the energy which is goes to 0 as the number of data points goes to infinite that is the actual thing. Coming to the next one some of the points we have to remember some points it is going to be most important that to be remembered over there. In the context of neural network each function is going to be defined by the weights w of the network as already we people are aware about that. So the uniform convergent theorem and the VC theorem ensures that the weight which is bounded by minimum of imperial risk also minimizes the risk as the number of q samples of the data points increases towards its infinite value okay that is going to be the thing so which is going to be ensure the uniform convergence theorem and this vc theorem which is going to ensure that the values the number of q data points which is going to increases towards the infinite that is just to be remembered by us and one more thing we have to remember that a finite data set a finite data set to train our machine we have a finite data set to train our machine as already we are aware about it. So when any machine is going to be trained on a specific data set which is finite it may be a finite data which may be a finite data. So the function it generates is a biased approximate it is going to be a biased approximate which may minimize the imperial risk or approximation error which may minimize the imperial risk or which may minimize the approximation error but not necessarily the expected risk or the generalized error okay it may not be get relayed upon the expected risk or generalization error we must understand about this one okay so when any machine is going to be trained on a specific data set then the function it generates is a biased approximate which will be useful for us to minimize the imperial risk or the approximation errors but not necessarily the expected risk on the generalized error okay now so which will not be get taken into consideration let me move on to the next topic indicator functions and labeling a vc dimension this is nothing but a vc dimension so indicator functions and labeling considering a set of indicator functions f of is equal to f of x comma w as already we have come across over there which is going to be considered over there that maps the point from rn into 0 comma 1 r it may be minus 1 comma 1. So these are called as indicator functions these are called as indicator function which is going to be present over there this is called as indicator function. 
In this present uh, scenario, if you are going to see about that, we will consider the set of functions that maps data point into one or uh, two classes in one, uh, con if, if you are going to consider about that, uh, one uh, considers a Q point in the particular value, each of this can be assigned a class of 0 or 1 randomly, which is going to be considered as 0 or 1 randomly, that is going to be called as labeling, that is going to be called as labeling. Let us call this assignment as labeling, okay. So, clearly we can mention that one the Q points can be labeled in 2 to the power of Q ways, 2 to the power of Q different ways. For example, we will see about the particular figure labeling in 3D, labeling in 3D. So, this for this three points in the plane, the eight possible labelings are shown in this particular slide. Three points are going to be there, 1, 2, 3. For this, we have taken into 8 consideration, 2 to the power of 3 is equal to 8, 8 consideration. The Q value is equal to 3, so 2 to the power of Q is equal to 2 to the power of 3, so we are going to get 2 to the power of 3 becomes 8 possible ways are going to be get present over there. If you are going to see about that, the three points are there, so line is going to be up upon the dots, upon the points and in between the points, it is going to be segregating in a different way, different slots have been given over there. So, this is going to be called as three points in the particular plane can be labeled in eight different ways, a non-linear orientation discussion boundary which can shatter all eight labelings. Now, we are going to consider about that if the set of indicator function f can correctly classify each of the possible way of 2 to the power of q labelings, then we can say that the set of point is going to be shattered by the function f. So, the VC dimensions of this set of functions essentially qualifies or quantifies the intrinsic capacity of that particular set measured in terms of the largest number of data points that can be shuttered by the set in questions. So, based on that particular points, based on that particular notation, we have the following definition that the VC dimension H, the VC dimension H for a set of function F is defined as the large number, the large set of points, the large set of points that can be shattered by the function f in this particular set question. So, recall that uh, the threshold logic neuron TLN, the threshold logic neuron TLN implements a linear oriented decision boundary within the particular mapping points on one side of the boundary to 0 or minus 1 and thus on the other side it can be 0 or plus 1. For this 8 possible labeling what we have seen in this particular diagram, the T <coughs> sorry, the threshold logic neuron can correctly separate or classify all 8 configurations as shown in this figure. This is achieved by carefully placing the hyperplane to have the correction orientation. That is in a way that all points to be classified as plus 1 lies on the positive side of the hyperplane which indicated by the small arrow. We can see this small arrows which is going to be indicate that it is going to be towards the positive side. The small arrows have been shown over there. If we increase the number of points to 4, there are 16 possible ways to label. So, as we are aware about that, the Q value is equal to 4, then 2 to the power of Q becomes 2 to the power of 4 and which is going to be dealt as 2 to the power of 4 becomes a 16 possible ways, 16 
possible ways to label the particular points. So observe now that two of the 16 labeling cannot be correctly classified by the linear decision boundary. One of this case is going to be shown in this figure as if you are going to see about that since the largest set of points in the particular point can be shattered in three. So we say that the VC dimension of the set of the oriented straight lines is going to be three. So the VC dimension H is equal to three thus provides us with a measure of the intrinsic capacity of this linear decision function in the space of R square under consideration. So we are going to take about this particular points over here. Understand? So this is the way it is going to be there. So as I said labeling of four points in this particular region that cannot be correctly separated by a linear core uh, or oriented decision boundary. If you are going to see about that, it is not able to be get identified, which is going to be get differently placed. And a quadratic decision boundary can separate this labeling. How? This quadratic is going to separate this so that this is going to be one region and this is going to be in another region. Such a way we can do that one. So the figure B shows that the labeling of this figure A which has a straight line, the figure A as a straight line boundary cannot separate because it, uh, it becomes one change that set of functions from linear to quadratic. So I am going to change that one into a quadratic function clearly that it says that the intrinsic separation capacity of the quadratic function is going to be higher than that of the linear function that can be easily identified from this figure. Let me see about the linear decision function which is going to be get present over there. We have to convey that there is a proof that the q points in r power n can be shorted by oriented here. If means if and only if. Okay, So the hyperplane if when we choose any one of those points as an origin, the position vector of this remaining q minus 1 points are linearly independent. So this observation permits the above idea to be get generalized to the situation of this r to the power of n. Notice that we can always choose n plus 1 points in this particular r to the power of n such that if any one of this is going to be considered as the origin of the remaining n are linearly independent. Since n points in this particular region can be linearly independent. So this cannot be case, this cannot to be the case if we start out with n plus 2 points. So since no n plus 1 points in this particular region can ever be linearly independent it follows at most n plus 1 points in this particular region Rn can be scattered by an oriented hyperplan and otherwise the VC dimension of this set of oriented plans is going to be n plus 1. In this case this is also equal to the number of free parameters that described by the hyperplanes. So this is going to be a free parameters that is going to be described by this hyperplan. Let me see about the growth function. The growth function, what is a growth function? The notation of a growth function plays an extremely important role in statistical learning theory. What is the statistical learning theory? Already we have come across about that one, isn't it? This is going to be an theory in this an extremely important role which is going to be played by this growth function in this statistical learning theory. Let me consider a point, let me consider a sample q points in this particular region and a set of 0 to 1 indicator functions f. We are going to take a set of indicator functions which is going to be shattered by the function f. Let we denote the number of different labeling on this q point that can be scattered by this region f as n suffix xq. Obviously n suffix xq is going to be equal to or 
equal to or lesser than 2 to the power of q. Since q point can be labeled in at most 2 to the power of q different ways, then the growth function is going to be defined as g of q is equal to natural logarithm of this function. This is going to be the function which is going to be present over here, where the supremes is taken over all possible samples of the size q, we can clearly say that g of q must satisfy the following bound that is going to be q of g of q is going to be equal to or less than logarithm 2. That is going to be the situation which is going to be get deals over here. As we are going to aware about that, that growth function which is going to be dealt over there g of q is going to be lesser than or equal to q log natural logarithm of 2. A very important result in the statistical learning theory is that for the distribution independent, that is for any of this p of x comma d, the probability value of p of x comma d with a uniform convergence of imperial risk, it is necessary and is sufficient that this VC dimension of the set of the indicator function be finite. Once again note that the growth functions are different to compute in practice. Let me see about the next one. As a for a set of indicator function, a sample of Q, it is shown that the either the growth function can be linear where it satisfies the following quality. So that we have taken the condition as g of q is going to be lesser than that of h of the terminology and from this we are going to get that g of h is equal to h of natural logarithm of 2 and such conditions can be get satisfied when h replaces with h plus 1. Nothing as between this if you are going to see about this diagram which is going to shown over there about this particular orientations. So remarkably no other behavior in between these two functions which are plotted in the figure which have been shown over there is permissible. So the maximum or a maximal q which with the function f can shatter this is the vc dimension it is going to be the point at which these two functions deviates from one another can be seen from this condition of h value. So the growth function for our example f of sin, if you can take about that f of f is equal to sin of, we are going to take the sin value. So sin of w into x, that is going to be dealt over there, it is a linear and therefore the VC dimension is going to be infinite. So this is an another way to understand the meaning of this VC dimension. Let me continue the further topics in other video. Thank you.